um, start recording our uh, session here. Welcome to the uh, 14th annual uh, Sachs Milner Holocaust Education Program. It's lovely to, to have everyone here. Uh, we're, we're glad you could join us. Uh, first, uh, I want to begin by thanking a number of people, um, as I always do, uh, who made this program possible. Uh, you know, usually we're in the beautiful sanctuary at Adith Israel. Um, today we're on Zoom, which presents the, the challenge of not being able to do our program the way we would normally like to, but also gives us some opportunities. Uh, we have people from all over the country joining us as guests, and our speakers are also from uh, another state and another country. Um, and so uh, we're just really blessed uh, to, to be able to be here on Zoom for this really important, vital program that uh, we provide each year. And uh, I want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, first to Linda and Steve Gallen uh, for their dedication to educating everyone, especially not just Jews, but non-Jews as well about the Holocaust. Um, we're just tremendously grateful for the commitment that you made to create this program uh, now 14 years ago, over 14 years ago. I also want to thank Laurel Cantor for her graphic design, the beautiful uh, uh, flyers that she created and postcard, um, and which she does every year for the Sax Milner program. I also want to thank Bernice Abramovich for uh, her uh, PR help in, in getting the word out about the program. I also want to acknowledge uh, Stephen Sax Milner, who is here with us today as well, part of the Sax Milner family. Uh, thank you as well to Rabbi Dan Grossman, our Rabbi Emeritus, who was very instrumental in bringing the Sachs Milner program to Adith. I also want to thank Hedda Morton, uh, our uh, previous director of congregational learning, who uh, shepherded this program for, for many, many years uh, and uh, really um, was uh, uh, tremendously important in, uh, in this program, uh, getting started and developing the reputation that it has. I want to take a moment to honor uh, Dr. Arthur and Mrs. Esther Sachs Wilner, who are uh, the the our lecture is uh, sponsored in their memory. Uh, Arthur and his brother Irwin were partners in a practice of medicine. They were EENTs, uh, longtime members of Adith Israel Congregation during World War II. Irwin was deployed as a medic uh, in Europe. Uh, Arthur remained in the United States to treat soldiers, uh, and um, the, his interest in the Holocaust began during that time. Uh, during his lifetime, Arthur received commendations from President Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, and Richard Nixon. Uh, he was also honored by the state of New Jersey, um, by Senator Shirley Turner, uh, and then uh, Assemblyman, but now Mayor of Trenton, Reed Gashiora, and uh, then Assemblywoman, but now our Congresswoman for our congregation, Bonnie Watson Coleman. Um, Arthur had a wonderful life, but he also had a wonderful wife who supported him. And it's very much due to Esther Sachs Wilner that we have this program today. She made it clear that she wanted Arthur's name to live on. Uh, and uh, it certainly has in this program that has been going on for now 14 years. And before we begin, I, I also want to make mention of uh, two people who are uh, very special to Linda Gallen, uh, Flora and Walter Schwartz. They're the parents of Linda's friend since childhood, Evelyn Evie Schwartz Bryant, who is on with us today. She and her sister uh, Sue, I believe, also um, is, is on the Zoom uh, as well. And Flora and Walter were from Vienna. Fortunately, they were able to escape with the help of the underground, and the Schwartzes came to Trenton, a place that they dearly loved. Walter worked uh, for the state of New Jersey as an accountant, and Flora worked as a seamstress for the elite women's clothing shop Lillian Charm. They were wonderful, hardworking, and giving, but very unassuming people. And today, we're going to hear the story of one family's 
uh, escape and, and uh, hiding and, and saving during the Holocaust. But of course, there are millions of stories that uh, can be told about the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, today, I, I hope that we pay tribute to them and to so many other survivors of the Holocaust who rebuilt their lives in this country. And two of those were uh, Flora and Walter uh, and their family who are joining us today. We, we pay tribute to them. About our program, uh, two years ago, we were joined by Hedy Komiati, uh, who actually came to me on the recommendation of Yvette Catlin, uh, Hazan Catlin's wife. Both uh, Yvette and Hedy uh, sadly have passed away. Uh, Hedy told her story uh, to us two years ago about how her parents had saved two Jewish families in their Rotterdam church in the Netherlands. And today we're going to hear the story of one of those families that was saved. Two years ago, when, when Hetty came to Adith, I corresponded with Daphne Geismar uh, to see if she could come and be part of the event. But she was actually busy completing the book that she and Sharon are going to be talking about today. Uh, but instead, she sent me a note uh, to read. I believe uh, she sent me uh, some readings, uh, one written by her, but I think one written by Sharon. And I was able to read them to kind of uh, fill out the story that, that Hetty told through the film of, of her story and her, uh, and her presence at our congregation. And so this year, when I was thinking about who we should have for our Sax Wilner program, I went back and asked Daphne if she would be able to present, because I thought that actually Zoom could benefit uh, from, uh, we could be benefit from the presentation because of the visual nature of the book and her talk, and also allow us to hear from her cousin Sharon, who is in Israel, something we couldn't do in a normal year. So I'm really happy and excited that they could both present to us today. We we'll want to uh, introduce them now. Uh, Daphne Geismar, uh, who's in Connecticut, designs books on art and art history for major museums. Her involvement in publications that use art and literature to educate began with her thesis at Yale University on The Direction magazine, in which artists and writers speak out against fascism. Geismar developed a photography and writing program for teenage mothers and teaches design at universities. And she's produced and uh, written a number of art books, um, which uh, are uh, available on uh, her website um, to learn more about them. We'll also be hearing from Sharon Strauss, who works as an embryologist in an IVF unit. She makes babies every day. That's a wonderful thing uh, to be able to do. Uh, Sharon worked as a neurosurgical nurse and as a genetic researcher. She served as a commander of the electronic intelligence course in the IDF intelligence Corps. So it's uh, my pleasure and um, honor to introduce our speakers, Daphne Geismar and Sharon Strauss. I'm going to spotlight them uh, now. Uh, so we can uh, should be able to see them. And uh, thank you for joining us. We're, we're so happy that you could be here to present. Thank you so much, Rabbi Adler, for the wonderful introduction to us and the program and all those in support of the program and for circling back two years later and um, having us uh, today. And thank you everyone for being here. As Rabbi Adler mentioned, um, we're international today and I'm uh, talking to you from New Haven, Connecticut. And- um, uh, Yes, I'm talking to you from a small town uh, in the Northern Israel near Nazareth. So I'm going to share the screen now to start our presentation. Can you see that? Excellent. Okay. 
So today we're going to tell you about a 14 year journey during which we discovered the life stories of our mothers, their sisters and parents, the Jezuta family. They were a Jewish family living fulfilling lives until they were slowly restricted from society during the German occupation of the Netherlands. Eventually the Jezuta family went into hiding. The three girls were separated from their parents and from one another for three years because splitting up increased their chance of survival. Our book weaves together their breathtaking and intimate stories, which were unknown to us until a surprise phone call arrived. In early 2006, my mother received a phone call from a relative. Uh, she said, you are a deserter, right? Uh, her relative had just uh, seen an ad in the newspaper for D Dutch immigrants in Israel looking for descendants of two Jewish family and uh, for Chaim and Fifi de Zute. Uh, the ad um, was placed by the congregation of the Bre Plain Church in Rotterdam. They actually wanted to invite descendants of those two Jewish family to celebrate the 75th anniversary celebration uh, of the church. So this was the first time we ever heard our grandparents uh, were hiding in an attic of a church. 11 of our family members went to the Netherlands to attend the ceremony uh, in the church. On the left is the sanctuary and the organ pipes. And on the right is the attic where Chaim and Fifi were hidden, which is above and behind the organ pipes. After hiding in the attic for almost two years and shortly before liberation, there was a Nazi raid on the church. Our grandfather Chaim wrote about the terrifying event and included this drawing of the hiding place. I will read the next excerpt from our grandfather Chaim diary on the raid. I hear someone's walking through the church. There is the sound of multiple footsteps. Carefully, I hold the edge of the opaque green curtain against the wall and use my finger to create a small crack only to grow rigid with fear at that very moment. On the podium below me, between the pews of the elders and deacons, at a distance of perhaps four meters, there are two green police walking around, searching everything. And then comes the stage of paralysis, the sense that all is lost. 61 years later, I had a moment alone in the organ loft. I pulled back the curtain to look into the nave just as my grandfather had when he saw the Nazi police searching between the pews. There is, yes, now we have a little bit of uh, time gap, oh. so I'm sorry if I'm oh, start, okay. starting a little bit late. <laughs> there is still a small chance now. The super heavy letter still has to be raised. One slip and that's the end. For the Germans are already below me in the foyer from which we are separated by thin slats of wood. They're coming up the stone staircase to the little storage space. I close the trap door and cover the cracks with a cloth and a German hand is already at the door of the storage space. I remain standing on the trapdoor, completely motionless. Just before the raid, Chaim placed the lunch dishes on this brick wall that you see in these photographs. This is where our grandfather was standing in the dark after he raised the ladder. After what seemed to him like an eternity, the sextant's wife knocked on the trapdoor to tell him that the Nazis had left. When they turned on a light, a spoon teetered right on the edge of the brick wall from the lunch dishes. Had it fallen when the Nazi police were standing below, our grandparents and their rescuers would certainly have been murdered. Reverend Gerrit brillenburg worth and his wife Gerda saved the life of our grandparents, uh, who were completely strangers to them. At the ceremony in 2006, we met their grandchildren, they invited us uh, for dinner at their home in Amsterdam. It was a lovely and emotional evening. Uh, they asked our mothers, Miriam and uh, Judith, to tell them more about the war. 
and we started to hear stories we never heard before. That night, we decided uh, that we should start collecting all the stories. And that night was the first time uh, that the idea of a book came up. When we returned to the United States and to Israel, we both asked our mothers to tell us more about their experience during the war. My mother led me to an antique desk and opened the bottom drawer. It was filled with letters, diaries, and documents about our family members' experiences during the Holocaust. Sharon, do you remember right after I discovered this drawer, I called you to tell you the news? Yes, I do. And you remember I told you that my mother have an Holocaust drawer too. Um, in both drawers, uh, we found documents for our grandparents, Chaim and Fifi Dezute, from their three daughters, uh, Miriam, Hadassah, and Judith, and from their future husband, uh, our fathers, David and Nathan, and also from Erwin, Daphne's parental grandfather all from the Netherlands. They became the eight narrators uh, of our book. Daphne, do you remember at one point we thought we are going to name the book uh, The Holocaust Drawers, you remember? Yes, because we were always talking about the yes. Holocaust Drawers, the, the never ending Holocaust Drawers with yes. so much information. I th think it still might be the best title. Yes, maybe. <laughs> maybe on it's another too, version. Too late now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the eight narrators in Invisible Years are from three families. This is the Dezuta family. The adults are our grandparents, Chaim and Fifi. Before they had children, Fifi was a nurse and director of a children's hospital. Her friends were artists and writers, and she also often participated in um, feminist causes. Chaim was a pharmacist who was interested in philosophy. He was required to work as a military pharmacist in the Dutch East Indies in return for the military financing his education. The three girls were born in the Dutch East Indies where this photo was taken. The family returned to Rotterdam in 1936 where they shared happy and fulfilling lives. This is a photograph of the three deserted girls shortly before the German uh, occupation. From the left is Hadassah, Miriam, she is Daphne's mother, and Judith, she is my mother. From the Geismar family, one narrator is David. He's on the left and he is my father. David and his parents emigrated from Germany to the Netherlands. David was a mischievous boy who loved to play with his friends in Amsterdam. The other narrator in the Geismar family is David, David's father, Erwin. Erwin had a factory where he designed and manufactured leather accessories. In 1940, he volunteered as a social worker for the Committee for Jewish Refugees. We learn a lot about the social and political situation from Erwin. David's mother, Hreta, who's also in this photograph, is not a narrator because she didn't leave any writings. And this has really made me think about the importance of documentation and evidence and leaving a story. In the Cohen family, the only narrator is Nathan, my father, but we learn about his two sisters and parents from him. My father grew up in Appledorn, a, a city surrounded by nature in the center of the Netherlands. His father was a general practitioner. In 1939, all three family welcomed German Jewish refugees into their homes. In the case of the Dezute and the Cohen family, they both fostered a girl in the age of their children. We'd like to show you just a few of the things we found in the drawers. In my mother Miriam's drawer, I found what I consider to be a miracle. It's a document written in German, which I don't speak, but fortunately my husband, Rob, does. After reading the first page, Rob turned to me and said, this is a memoir that your paternal grandfather, Erwin, wrote while he was in hiding. I knew almost nothing about Erwin. On the first page, Erwin writes, why do I begin just today to write on the day that has brought me the most personal worries of the last three and a half years? 
most likely because I am alone with my thoughts and worries, because I no longer have my daily occupation, because my domestic surroundings are dissolved, because the chance to commit my entire being to help my family and myself has been taken from me. Perhaps too, the helplessness in which I find myself condemned to sitting still, the unaccustomed quiet. And towards the end, Irwin writes, in the end, I hope that my lines will be read by people who will see how we struggled under terrible circumstances and that the reader will want to take up the struggle that we have fought and experienced from the front lines for the construction of a worthwhile, humane society. Irwin began writing his memoir on July 21st, 1943 in the Amsterdam apartment where he was hidden two days after he had sent his 13 year old son, David, my father to a safer address. Six weeks later, Erwin was captured by the Germans and on November 19th, 1943, murdered in Auschwitz. Somehow we have a guess that we don't specifically know how his memoir was returned to the family. Neither my mother nor my father knew it lay hidden in an envelope with my grandmother's papers. My father died three years before we found it. For me, bringing my grandfather and father's voices back together is the joy and sorrow of this book. In my mother, Judith's draw, we found her yellow star. People often ask me how I felt when I found it. Uh, actually, I was numb. Uh, I'm good uh, with repressing my feelings. Uh, my mother, Judith, was almost 10 years old when she went into hiding. She wrote uh, about the day she had to leave her parents and sisters. After arrangements were made, our parents told my sister and me, go to Uncle Kiss, but before you reach his house, make a stop and go under one of the bridges on the way and take off your jacket with the star and leave it there. Once you reach his house, he will take care of everything. Under the bridge, I took off my jacket and put it in a bag ahead with me. At that moment, I didn't realize the danger of keeping the star. I kept it a secret, realizing I had disobeyed my father and put it in a book I love to read. This letter by our grandfather Chaim was in Miriam's drawer. It's addressed to his three daughters, written five years after the end of the war. After it was translated, it was written in, in Dutch, which we don't speak. We knew it was a guide of sorts to make sense of the world after the Holocaust. Chaim draws from the Bible, Buddhist texts, Jewish philosophers, scientists, and writers. We continued to find things for another decade. Many of our findings led to more questions. So there was a lot that we searched for. Other information seemed to find us. In the piles I brought home from the Holocaust drawer, I found a typed translation of this note. The note was written by my mother Miriam to her parents when she was a child in hiding. The English translation was done by Miriam as an adult after the invention of email. If there was a translation, I thought to myself, there had to be an original. So I went back to my mother's house to search the Holocaust drawer again. When I didn't find the note there, my mother revealed that there were more papers in her bedroom. And indeed, there were two tall piles on her dresser. And I found this beautiful fragment there. In her note, Miriam reassures her parents that she is okay, describing her cozy bedroom. But from Miriam's account, we know that that quickly changed. Miriam wrote about the sleeping arrangement in her account. When the Germans started to unexpectedly search home for hidden weapons, hidden Jews, and hidden pilots from Dalden airplane, a friend of the family came to make a hiding place under the kitchen floor. He made a trap door and then put linoleum over it. You could crawl in it. Two mattresses were put on the dirt floor. Every night at seven for the remaining years of the war, more than two years, we said good night and the four of us went down into our little night prison. We were not allowed to talk out loud when we were in there. You never knew who was above your head in the kitchen. 
And I just want to clar clarify that when Miriam says the four of us, she's referring to herself and three other Jewish children who were hidden in the same home. Miriam didn't know the other children until they were hiding together. When I discovered the bedroom piles, I also found four loose pages from Fifi's diary written on the infamous date of April 23rd, 1943. I knew from a letter my grandfather had written that this was, in his words, the day every Jew had to disappear. Both Chaim and Fifi wrote about uh, their desperate need for hiding place on that day. It is, this is a detail of uh, uh, Chaim's account written in English to Yad Vashem. On that day, after changing seven different hiding places already, they actually didn't know where they were going to spend the night. They met uh, Reverend Brillenburg Wurst uh, at a friend's house and he found a short-term arrangement for them. But then he returned and he said that he spoke to the sexton of the church and he asked him to prepare a hiding place in the attic of the church. Can you imagine that Mr. DeMars, the sexton, told him that he is already hiding another Jewish family in the attic of the church for almost a year now? So they agreed to prepare another hiding place in the other side, and they thought it would be for 10, 14 days, uh, but they stayed there for two years. The last year and a half in hiding was the most difficult for the Jesuita girls. It was too dangerous for resistance workers to deliver letters between the hiding places. So the girls didn't know if their sisters and parents were alive. Miriam, my mother in this engraving detail was sleeping under floorboards as we just read. Miriam and Hadassah were suffering from lack of food. Miriam was often sent to beg for tulip bulbs and sugar beets from farmers. The new wife of the man who was hiding Hadassah on the left here did not know that Hadassah was Jewish and sent Hadassah to stand in line for food at the Gestapo headquarters. Nazi sympathizers received extra ration cards and because the new wife of this man um, who did know Hadassah was Jewish was hiding her, um, sent Hadassah out to, to get these extra rations. And Judith on the right had to leave the home where she was hiding with three older women because of increased raids in the neighborhood. She was taken to a farm owned by a family with eight children, not knowing the horror that she was about to endure. When Judith, Sharon's mother, my aunt, realized the book would be published, she made the difficult decision to share her complete story. She had written about it with plans to leave it for Sharon and her two sisters to read after her death. What you're looking at is the back of a photograph of the couple who hid Judith, receiving recognition for hiding her. At the bottom, you can read the crimes of the father and two of his sons. This is an excerpt from the letter that Judith wrote to her daughters. The last family I was hiding with was where it happened. The father and two of his sons, 16 and 17 years old, abused me. There was nothing I could do and nobody I could go to. I never told my parents. Years after, Poppy submitted their names to the righteous list in Yad Vashem. And sometime later, they sent us a letter with pictures of the ceremony in the Israeli consulate, where they got a medal and a certificate and trees planted in their name for saving a Jewish life. In 2016, Judith, her daughters and I requested that this person be removed from the righteous at Yad Vashem. He was the opposite of moral and virtuous. I met with the director of the Department of the Righteous and gave her Judith's written account. They took it very seriously. The Yad Vashem board and a judge reviewed the case and his name was removed. After Daphne came to Israel, we went together to the Netherlands uh, with Daphne's husband, uh, Rob, and with my eldest son, Jonathan. We picked up photographs, uh, we went to archives, 
uh, we visited the helpers and the hiding places. And we went to the small town of Ghent, uh, near the border of Germany, uh, just north of the Vol River. Uh, Ghent is the area where Operation Market, Market Garden took place in September 1944. And Ghent is where my father Nathan was hidden together with his parents and two sisters. This is my father Nathan. Nathan and his family were hidden by a policeman named Theo van Dalen and his wife Betsy. During the occupation, Theo enacted detailed plots to sabotage the German war effort. In the aftermath of that market garden, Teo and Betsy's house was bombed. Miraculously, all in the house survived, but Natan and his family had to quickly find a new hiding place. Teo's um, detailed plots were, were actually even sometimes had wry humor and Natan's um, account, entire account really reads like an adventure story. Here's just a little bit. The Germans shot down bombers and fighters over Holland. Theo must have had good contacts with the Dutch underground because that winter he had more guests, Canadian, English, and American pilots on their way back to England. I practiced my English and my chess on the poor downed aircrew members. We also kept war maps, which we prepared ourselves, first tracing them from the world atlas and then enlarging them by scaling. We had two different lines of pins for Russia, sometimes hundreds of kilometers apart. One where the Germans said the front was and one where the BBC said the front was. My grandfather, Isaac Cohen, Yitzhak Cohen, and Theo van Dillen received this certificate signed by Eisenhower, who was the commander of the Allen forces in Europe at that time. The certificate is for gallant service in assisting the escape of airline soldier from the enemy. Daphne, do you remember we spoke about it a lot? Uh, we were uh, wondering why our parents didn't tell us anything. We said it was too hard to them. We said maybe they wanted us to have a normal childhood. Uh, maybe they wanted to move on. But I never understood why hide this amazing certificate and brave stories. I mean, it's a source of pride. And now I know. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, we had a treasure trove of stories from our extended family to turn into a book. I first understood the power of words and images when working on my thesis at Yale. It was on Direction magazine, published from 1937 to 1945. In this magazine, artists and writers spoke out against fascism and social injustice. The provocative covers are by the great graphic designer, Paul Rand. At the time, I didn't realize how connected my thesis was to my family history. With our family archive before me, I was able to draw on 20 years of experience planning, designing, and producing books on art and history for museums. When I was working on Invisible Years, I decided to form an advisory group. They kept me to my deadlines and offered advice and assistance in myriad ways. Um, we met for about two, two and a half years, every two or three months um, after work and always had really excellent snacks. <clears throat> These are just a few things from our archive. Everything was transcribed, translated, and scanned. So we have a digital and physical archive. Once everything was typed and in English, I printed everything out and read through all the accounts, realizing that no one person had the complete story, but their collective accounts made it whole. So what I did was I cut up everyone's accounts creating content groupings and then sequencing the groupings and the excerpts within them to create a single narrative. When I first read the interwoven voices, it was the most emotional moment for me in making the book. The multiple perspectives provided a nuanced sense of the German occupation and the many different experiences just our eight family members had in hiding. 
It isn't an oversimplified idea of what the war was like. The, for the first time, I really understood the horror of what happened, how it happened, and what it was like for our family members. And I put my head on the table to weep. As I pieced the narrative, I was curious about the people, institutions, and events mentioned by the narrators. So I researched and read about them, then drafted short history briefs with a writer. And finally, I worked with Robert Young Van Pelt, the Holocaust historian, who wrote the foreword for the book and also fact-checked and added to the history briefs. I worked with a photographer who shoots art for museums to digitally capture the photographs and artifacts that are in the book. And on December 19, uh, 2019, just before the whole world skies uh, were closed, we met in Florence, Italy for the printing of the book. It was a very exciting moment. After 14 years, we finally had a book. The book is 248 pages with 63 images, 64 history briefs, and the trim is slightly oversized. It's eight and a quarter by 11 and three quarter inches. The end leaves are the lining paper at the bottom of my mother's Holocaust drawer. Each chapter opens with an introduction and a timeline. The introductions are by Robert Young and they provide historical context. The timeline summarizes what's happening at parallel moments with the narrators, politics, society, and the war. One juxtaposition at the start of this timeline for the separated chapter when they're just starting to go into their first mostly temporary hiding places is that we have the Dezuta girls going into hiding in the same month that their cousins are murdered in Auschwitz. One juxtaposition, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the chapters titled Before, Trapped, Forbidden, and Separated are organized by family grouping. This is the Jesuta section of the chapter titled Before. And here on the left-hand page, you can see the interwoven voices as the conversation changes between Maryam Yudit and Hadassah. And the outside margins throughout the book are the history brief collapse just opposed to relative to related references in the personal narrative. This map opens the hiding chapter. It shows the hiding places of the eight narrators, the name of those who helped, the dates and the addresses. The map flips out and shows the hiding places in the east. Uh, Daphne shows you. It, <laughs> yes, <laughs> the Dezuta family addresses came from a letter that uh, my grandfather Chaim wrote to Yad Vashem. And we actually didn't know about those letters until we uh, connected Mordechai Paltiel. He was the former director of Yad Vashem uh, Righteous Among Nation Department. And he told us that our father wrote uh, uh, very detailed letters. And he was one of the first one to write those letters and to ask for recognition. And in total, the map shows 27 documented hiding places, hiding addresses for eight people. In the chapter titled Invisible, when all the narrators are in hiding, their voices are separate. Um, I tried to interweave their voices in the, in once I got to, building the narrative in the hiding section, but it wasn't working. And I kept trying and trying and trying, and it seems so obvious now, but of course they each have to have a different subsection with only their voice because they're in isolation and they're having completely different experiences from one another. So in the hiding section, there are eight subsections for each narrator. And then when the allied troops liberated um, the Netherlands, and all but one narrator came out of hiding, um, their voices are interwoven again. This is my mother's Judith uh, teddy bear. He was with her the entire time she was in hiding. 
she gave it to me, and he usually sits on my bookshelf. But the last year, or even earlier, he flew to the United States for his photograph to be taken for the book. Um, I miss him, we miss him. One day he will return to Israel, but I'm mostly very, very happy that he was with her all the time she was in hiding. Uh, my mother is the only one from the eight narrators that is alive today, and she lives happily next door to us. Of the eight narrators, uh, seven survived. When the war was over and they came out from hiding, they found out that 61 close family members were murdered. Mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, grandparents, aunt, uncles and cousins. This list remembers them. It contains the name, relationship, ages and dates and place of murder. Most of them were murdered in Sobibor and Auschwitz. We're going to end um, our presentation today with these words of thanks that our grandfather Chaim wrote about those who helped him and his family. When the war was over and we were free once again, days of great happiness arrived. It was as if life itself had been put back into our hands for our very life had been stripped from us, which is to say from European Jewry. And it wasn't because we deserved it that death passing by us so closely had spared us. Gladness and gratitude overwhelmed me. Gratitude to all of those who had supported us during the war years and an emotion of thankfulness that for now I will call divine. But this feeling was almost immediately stifled remembering just one of the millions of cases where the children had not returned. Surely countless ones among them must have been a thousand times more deserving than we. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Sharon and, and Daphne for an amazing presentation. And uh, if there are questions that people have, uh, please, uh, you can put them into the chat um, and uh, we can answer. Um, or, uh, or raise your hand and I can uh, uh, unmute you. Um, and uh, so uh, I see we already have one question, uh, one hand up and um, people can certainly put others into the chat. Um, so I wanted to just ask uh, before we get to uh, others, uh, the question, uh, the, the uh, Minister of Family uh, is Brillenberg Wurtz. Uh, that's Hedy Komiati's uh, parents, uh, who uh, Hedy, who uh, lived here in New Jersey, and uh, she had uh, told her story at at Adith, uh, two years ago uh, during the, our Holocaust education program. Um, and I know that I don't. I don't think you ever were able to meet her. Uh, but was she able to fill in maybe some holes in, in the story that you were creating for the book? Did she, was she able to add anything or, or were there conflicts uh, between her story? I know she told us also the story or it might be in her film uh, that you had mentioned of the, the minister going to his sex sim and saying, uh, can you hide this family? And he said, well, actually, I already have a family on one side of the choir, uh, the, uh, the, the loft. And uh, so we could put them in the other one. But was there, were there things that she added? Do you want to answer, Sharon? Or... Yeah, I want to tell you that uh, I never met uh, Hedy, and, but uh, we met her family in Holland. And they actually helped, helped us a lot. Uh, when we came to the Netherlands, um, uh, the daughter, the granddaughter of uh, the Reverend took us to her father's house 
to look for photographs and to talk with him. He was already a little bit confused. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we started a little bit late. Uh, that was because nobody told us the stories and we, until the visit in the church, didn't have the drive to ask to hear them. Uh, so he couldn't add a lot of details. Uh, he made a movie, a short film with the church, which uh, added some details. And there was a historian that uh, accompanied the ceremony in the church in 2006 that uh, so, um, made an um, article about the whole story, which helped us too to understand what happened. And, uh, but Hetty, I never, actually, I never, uh, uh, never even heard of her uh, from her family. She, she came to, Hetty visited my mother um, in Connecticut before. Before, just before we started learning all the stories. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I never met her either. But um, as Sean, Sharon explained so well, um, her nieces and her brother have, you know, we've connected with and we still regularly communicate with her nieces today. And we keep hoping that someone will find, supposedly there was some written communications about Judaism and Christianity between Chaim and the Reverend. And uh, when we first met them, they thought that they had those and they've been asking family members and we all keep hoping that they'll surface somewhere because that would be remarkable. <laughs> I really, that would be amazing. Uh, that kind of dialogue happening in hiding just, um, you know, you could just visualize it as a, a, you know, you mentioned before a venture story, but a, a movie, you know, these great, a great debate. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. So, um, so Sherry Spiesel has her hand up. So I'm going to spotlight her. And I think you should be able to unmute. Sherry, there okay. you go. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful, thoughtful and sweet sentimental presentation. It was beautiful. I wanted to ask about the um, moving pictures at the very, the very final scenes. Were that, a couple of questions, were those the three original girls, the real three sisters? And if so, when and where were those photo, picture, moving pictures taken and how did they happen to have a movie camera? Do you want me to answer, Sharon? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so the, the book was pretty much done and designed and written by the time those, the films surfaced. Um, it was very late in the process. Our mothers have um, a cousin named Kaya Palak who lives in Amsterdam. And uh, she found them in her basement in, I think it was 2017. And um, so she had them digitized and sent them to us and it was, having you know, gotten to know our family members and working on this book for over a decade to suddenly see them moving in the time period. So yet yeah, to first answer the most important part of the question, that's Miriam Hadassah and Judith Dezuta, the three girls. We think given their ages and other parts of the film that it must be 1939. So probably the year before the German occupation. Um, we don't know exactly where the ladder is that they're climbing. Um, there's other parts of the film that show them in the kitchen of their house um, in Rotterdam. And the films were by um, Chaya's father, Hans Polak, um, who um, was very interested in the arts and had a film camera. And um, he tragically was murdered um, in Dachau. Um, so, um, you know, the films were put away somewhere and found 70 years later. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for asking. So um, there's a, another question um, from Beverly Rubman uh, who asks, um, it seems that the sisters were separated after the war to Israel and to the United States. Can you tell us more about what happened at that time and more about Hadassah? 
Sharon, do you want to take yes. this one? Uh, yes. Um, we have their story, written story about the part after the war. We thought we should, uh, we should limit the book to the story of the war, but actually the stories after it's, are very interesting too. Um, Miriam uh, went to Israel with the youth uh, movement. Actually, she went to Israel uh, with my father. They met there <laughs> in the youth movement. Uh, but as you understand, they, he married my mother in the end, <laughs> not, not Miriam. So they went uh, to Israel by this uh, youth movement. And then the Dezuta family, uh, Fifi Chaim, Hadassah and Yudit, uh, went to Israel together. Um, they had a rough time in the beginning. Uh, Chaim needed to find a, a, a job. And after looking for a long time, actually he found a, a job working as a pharmacist in Teva Company. If you know, Teva Company is one of the biggest drug companies today in the world, actually, not only in Israel. Uh, but my grandmother, Fifi, uh, was not in such a good uh, state. While she was in hiding, she took uh, sleeping pills to help her um, just past the time, and she was uh, addicted. And it, it took some years and uh, uh, a treatment to help her uh, get off the sleeping pills. And then she returned to be her uh, self, lively, uh, very talkative uh, lady <laughs> again. Uh, after a few years, um, Miriam and David got married and they uh, moved to the United States. And my father met Miriam's sister, Judith, and they got married and they stayed in Israel. And they, oh, and you ask about Hadassah specifically. Uh, Hadassah um, met Ziggy. Actually, if if you will see the book, we didn't have time in the presentation to tell you everything about the book. There is the bonus chapter uh, about Ziggy Mandel. Ziggy Mandel is Hadassah's husband and he has a remarkable story, uh, but he's not from the Netherlands. So uh, we shared his story, but in a different part of the book, he is uh, he's from Poland and he was actually traveling by, and through and from Warsaw to Siberia, to India, and then to Israel. It's an amazing story. Uh, and he met Adassa here in Israel and they were the most sweet, uh, loving couple I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, both of them are not alive today, uh, but uh, they're two boys. My cousins, uh, we meet a lot. <laughs> and I'll just add, um, just like Ziggy's story, which is remarkable, is sort of this bonus track at the end of the book that gives you a wider sense of the world beyond the Netherlands, um, or the war beyond the Netherlands. Um, there is a chapter titled After that gives kind of an overview of what became of the eight narrators and, and a little bit of information about how they decided to go to Israel. Um, so that's that additional information is also in the book. Thank you. Uh, and by the way, pe people were asking about where the book is available and I put links uh, into the chat uh, to the website about the book and also to uh, bookshop.org and, and Amazon where you can, you can find it if you, if you wanna purchase it. Um, we also have a, a question from Stephen Sachs Wilner. So I will um, actually uh, unmute or ask him to unmute. Uh, Stephen, if you want to ask your question. It's actually more of an acknowledgement. I just want to uh, thank you both uh, so much uh, for, for, it must have been painful uh, to go through all of this and to uh, bring this to us, it is so difficult now being separated by so many years 
and by in the states uh, by so many miles uh, to conceive of uh, what people were going through. And by telling the story, you really bring to, to, to life the, the, the heroism and the terror and the, the, the whole range of, of emotions and the experience itself. Um, so you kind of put flesh on the bones of history. And uh, I just want to really uh, thank you both and acknowledge you both for, uh, for this important work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for saying that and for listening and again, for making it possible to tell the story. Um, we do want to share it with as many people as possible. And, um, and you touched upon something that I think we think is really important, which is it's the story of the Holocaust. It's definitely not a story just for Jewish people to listen to. And the whole time we were working on it and making it, we realized how many echoes there are of what can be learned from this story to other things that are have happened and are happening in the world today and how dangerous it is you know when an entire group of people um, are um, considered as less than or other absolutely so there's a, another question um which uh, actually is a similar question that, that I had, so I'll combine them uh, uh, from Jeremy Kessler, who writes, the story is incredible and also your story of creating this now indelible piece of history. I'm also a descendant of survivors. What advice do you have for how to retrace and, and capture the history and honor the memory of our own families? Um, and I wanna echo that. Um, I also uh, have, uh, some amazing stories in my family and um, your story of the Holocaust tour is really powerful because uh, my grandfather wrote a, a short memoir. Also, uh, he, he was in Vienna and it was translated. My, my mother was able to translate it many years ago, but you know, it's, it wasn't necessarily written on archival uh, you know, material. And, and if you have kind of the, even some of the practical um, suggestions because of course we can't all write a beautiful book and create this kind of uh, piece of art the way that you were able to, but do you have any kind of um, suggestions as, as Jeremy asked for how we can preserve our own family stories and learn more about them? Um, shall I start? And then I'm kind of curious to yeah. see how you would answer that too, Sharon. <laughs> I must tell you, Daphne is the expert, Daphne is the artist, Daphne is the design, Daphne, Without Daphne, this book would have never uh, happened. Uh, and I think she can give you advices that I can never give you. So Daphne, please. Um, what comes to mind is something that I, is one of the most important things that I tell my clients and my students is that the physical form really has to grow out of the content. Um, so that's why no, no two books are ever going to be the same. I mean, so, you know, we have a lot of, thank, thankfully, you know, people do have these stories that should be told. And, um, while they are all about the same time period in history, no two story is alike. And so the form of each one would be different. So I think it's important first to, to, you know, get to understand what you have and then decide you know, what is the best way to make this into a book or a website or a talk. Um, you know, how, how's the best way, what is the best way to share the story? Should it be shared with my family or my community? Should it be shared with the wider world? And um, you, know, you might have one person with a really um, informative memoir or diary and one photograph or no photographs and you know maybe that one photograph is is used you know in a really beautiful respectful way um maybe it, there's no images but if you wanted to make it something more special you know some the paper and the binding and the typography um is something you could you know just you know just words are beautiful and maybe there's 
quotes that you take that might, you know, I've, I've read our book so many times now and um, just the other day, um, what was the, oh, it was National Book Day, I think. And my sister posted a quote on Instagram from my grandfather um, that was just beautiful. And, you know, I've been pulling quotes for talks like this and other, but that's a quote I hadn't focused on yet. And, and um, you know, maybe there's something you can do in a big way with a few key words. So I think it's very much about figuring what you have, what it means to you, and then how to make the, the most of it. And um, I haven't done it yet, but I've been thinking about putting together um, some kind of a workshop maybe where um, to help people get started um, putting their own material together. So it's something I'm thinking about. I, I want to add something. Um, if you have a story, if you have a relative that can still tell you the story. Don't wait. We waited too long. Just don't wait. Write it. Ask <laughs> questions. It doesn't, in the beginning, the format, uh, leave the, think about it later. Just get the stories, write them, and start doing it today because uh, really, we, in the last moment, uh, got all our stories. Yeah. And keep digging and keep, keep yeah. looking because um, so, for example, I knew nothing about my grandfather, Erwin. I, we suddenly had his memoir, but to protect everyone's identities and himself, you know, there were, there were no names in it. And so I had no idea where he was hidden or who he was hidden with. And um, my husband, when he was translating it into German, he, years later went back to um, tweak something and he was trying to find out some information about the factory that my grandfather owned, his leather goods factory. And it just so happened that somebody who had escaped from the house where my, where my grandfather was hiding had just put the, um, Erica Heyman, the woman who hit, hit him, just put her name into Yad Vashem and listed the people who had been hiding in the, hiding in the house. So when my husband put Erwin Geismar in, we, you know, seven years later, we found out who hit him. And then I was actually able to find her son who was 16 during the time my grandfather was hiding and he knew him well. And I was able to have a long conversation with him. Um, so things keep popping up and um, keep looking. And we're so lucky to have Google Translate and the internet <laughs> because um, it, provide so much information that would have been so difficult to um, access before. Thank you. And, and if you do uh, put together that uh, workshop, please let us know. I think I'm on your, your mailing list, but uh, your, your email list, but definitely I, I know people would be really interested in joining with that. And uh, somebody, uh, a, a couple of uh, people uh, sent direct messages to me about uh, museums, of course, which uh, preserve a lot of this material. Did you interact with uh, museums to help you in terms of archival material? And and did you? I know you you said you scanned everything. Did you put it that? Did you did you present it then to a museum, or is it sort of a uh, something? I'm sure there's a lot that did make it in the book that that you're keeping as your own personal archive, or was that given to to institutions? Do you want to answer? Yeah, yeah. we have a lot of uh, things that are not in the book uh, in our archive. Actually, a lot of things that uh, even have uh, yet to be translated from Dutch. Um, and yes, we are currently in the process of thinking about where do we want to uh, put the archive. It should be somewhere where people um, can see it, we hope. And we are currently uh, speaking to three museums. We are speaking to Yad Vashem, we are speaking to the Jewish Museum in uh, Amsterdam and to uh, the um, Jewish Museum in New York. Um, Museum of Jewish Heritage. Oh, Jewish New Heritage mm -hmm. in New York. Um, we didn't decide yet, um, but uh, one day it will, the archive will uh, get a, a place. Oh. A safe place, a home, yes. 
Thank you. And um, there was uh, there was a question uh, from Sid uh, about uh, a drawing. I think it's the drawing of the tree uh, that was in the in your presentation. I don't know if you could put it up yeah. again. Miriam's uh, drawing. Uh huh. If you're able to put it up again, um, maybe you could say a little bit more about what what the drawing is. Uh, so Sid says that he may have had something similar that was made in Auschwitz. This one, correct? We, we can't see it. Oh, hmm. okay, hold on a second, sorry. Screen sharing has failed to start. Try again. Oh. <laughs> let me, let me, <laughs> Joy is in Zoom. let me, yeah, let me try from the start. Can you see that? Yep, now we can see it. Okay, great. This is the drawing. Um, so this is drawing that Miriam made. Do you know where she made it? Yes, so she was um, hiding at um, Tante Nell Van Fleet's house um, in Harlem, which is about 30 miles west of Amsterdam on the coast. And um, it was her third hiding place and her final hiding place. So she was there for almost three years. And um, one of, I, you know, maybe this is somewhat behind the question, but um, when I saw this, I thought, well, if she was writing this to her parents, how was, how did they get it? Because um, I didn't realize that letters were delivered between hiding addresses. And then, and that's how sort of this one thing leads to another. Um, we learned about this remarkable woman named um, um, Tanta Reek. Um, I forget what's her um, last name. It's, it'll come to me. <laughs> I just think of her as Tanta Reek. Aunt Reek. And um, she was actually a good friend of the Brillenberg Wirths, and she was a nurse and she was very active in the resistance. And she, the other Jewish family hiding in the church, um, there was a young couple and they had a baby while in hiding. And Tante Reek, together with an ophthalmologist, um, helped deliver this baby in the attic hiding place. So um, Tante Reek, in addition to doing that, she acted as a liaison between the three Jesuit children and Chaim and Beefy. And Chaim writes about, you know, how you know the, the greatest gift was that she would bring them news of their daughters so they would know the last year, year and a half of the war that wasn't possible anymore because it was too dangerous. So Miriam had just moved um, to this um, new hiding place with, um, Tante Nell, and um, it's really kind of sadly sweet what's in this in this um, text that she writes to her parents because it's like she's the, you know she's the eleven year old girl ten year old girl and she's trying to reassure them you know that things are okay I'm all right I have this room it even it even has the same wallpaper similar wallpaper to my room at home and it's really like she's trying to to assure them that things are okay and then she drew this picture of the outdoors which is also quite interesting because for those two years she never went outside and you know she couldn't even go near a window um, so she has this picture of trees and rabbits and somebody fishing um, and so um interesting thing is at some point, I mean, my mother, I've never really said this before in any of our talks or even to you, Sharon, but I kind of think she was the, the first step in many ways of uh, as an archivist, because a lot of the material, especially the material that was in Dutch that we couldn't read, she had put notes on it in English and, you know, she kept them in a certain spot and you know, she put notes about who other relatives were that we didn't know. So she left a lot of hints, which was really quite wonderful. And um, so she had typed out a translation of this note in English. Um, 
So that's what I, and, and I had put it in the Holocaust drawer, but the note wasn't in the drawer. It was in the bedroom piles. Um, so I would not have known it there even about the bedroom piles had I not found this other typed note and thought, well, if she's talking about something she wrote to her parents, I'm wondering if there's an original somewhere. So um, that's, that's the story of this little fragment. And uh, Sid asked if it was in Auschwitz, but I don't think she was never in, in Auschwitz, right? That's no, right. she was in hiding. Right. But there's something I think very universal about it. There are other drawings that probably Sid is referring to of, uh, you know, children in these awful, terrible situations um, using art to um, try es and escape from the, the awful situation. And, and you see that here, you know, you could, I, looking at it, just me looking at it, you, you know, you can imagine any kid at any time um, uh, that uh, with crayons and, and, and colored pencils, just creating a world to, to, to help deal with the, the terrible things around them. Um, and, and that's just so beautifully captured in this, this picture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's it for our questions. Um, and of course, the, as, as I mentioned the, in the chat, we, we put in the uh, links to the, to the website of, about the book and, and opportunities to purchase it and, and to learn more about your, your story, your family story and, uh, and, and this amazing um, tale to tell and, and so important as, as has been mentioned, very powerful uh, and one that, that needs to be told and, and continue to, to, under, to be understood um, so that uh, something like the Holocaust can never happen again. So we, we deeply appreciate you being with us on Zoom and, um, and sharing your story and uh, we hope to hear perhaps more uh, in, in the future, whether it's uh, being able to access the full archive or uh, looking at the book uh, and uh, perhaps um, some more uh, presentations from, from uh, both of you. So thank you so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. I wanna thank everyone uh, for joining us here on Zoom uh, and we hope that you have a, a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Thank Rabbi you. Adler. It was really lovely to have the conversation and your questions were terrific. And it always provides us with more insight when we get to talk with others about it. So we really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, actually allow everyone to unmute uh, if you want to say goodbye. Uh, and uh, we'll conclude our program. Thank you all for joining. Bye, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. you. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll we'll share the recording. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, send it to the community and we'll also uh, share it uh, widely so people can see it. Have a good day, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you.